Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking 35 years ago. The book was a result of his own personal search for a way of life. People the world over so taken with his way of thinking, of talking, continue to keep the book a bestseller. His energy, his ability to inspire good from both pulpit and podium is renowned. Here we bring it to you on home video. It is an opportunity for a one-on-one -on -one with Norman Vincent Peale right in your own home. Who determines whether you or you or you or I are happy? The answer is you do. I do. Norman Vincent Peale tells us stories of people like ourselves, of common experiences, how within each one of us there exists the power of positive thinking. There exists the power for goodness, happiness, success in our lives. Take charge of your thoughts. You can do what you will with them. This home video is presented to suggest techniques and to give examples which demonstrate that you do not need to be defeated by anything, that you can have peace of mind, improved health, and a never-ceasing flow of energy. Practice the power of positive thinking because it works. This home video teaches a disciplined way of life. You may have to live with problems every day, but you can control what they do to your body and mind through faith with positive thoughts of good, of hope, of joy. The table of contents lets you use this tape as a simple personal improvement manual on video with the goal of achieving a happy, worthwhile, satisfying life. Right here in Pauling one day, I learned about a new set of thoughts, and I'd like to tell you about it. We were starting a magazine, and we ran out of money, and we got into a bad way, and we were about to fold, so some people said. So I called a meeting of our board of directors, and they all sat out here, and there wasn't an idea amongst them. They were absolutely frozen. But we had a woman at that meeting who was not a member of the board of directors by the name of Tessie. And this was a very fortunate thing. She listened to us talk and finally she said, you know what your trouble is? I said, no, you tell me. She said, you're all thinking lack, you're visualizing lack, you're acting lack and you have thereby created a condition of lack. That's why you lack everything. Well, this sounded like some vague, fantastic new thoughtism, and I began to write it off. But I scratched my head and I said, well, we have been thinking lack, that's a fact, and that we do lack is obvious. So I said to her, okay, Tessie, I'll buy that. What do we do now? She said, what do you do now? You stand up like men and women, and you tell these lack thoughts to get out of your head. <laughs> I said, now look, Tessie, that proves, if I may say so, that you are basically an uneducated woman because anybody who knows anything about the human mind will tell you that if you mount a frontal attack against an unhealthy thought pattern, instead of exorcising it or driving it out, you only tend to drive it more deeply into consciousness. Besides, I add, we don't control our thoughts. Our thoughts control us. Never will I forget the look of disgust that passed <laughs> over Tessie's face. She said, Norman, I'm sorry to hear you talk in such a weasel manner. She asked me, she said, don't you remember what the great Plato said? Well, I hadn't the slightest idea what the great Plato said, but I didn't want to reveal my ignorance, so I said, to which of the many familiar pla statements of Plato do you refer? <laughs> she said, I refer to the one you never heard of in your whole life before. She said that Plato said, take charge of your thoughts. You can do what you will with them.
Well, I was impressed. And I said, okay, I'll buy that one too. Now what do we do? She said, flush these lack thoughts out of your mind. Flush them out, she said. So we sat there for 15 minutes flushing out these lack thoughts. She said, okay, you can stop flushing. Your minds are empty. And she added, I must say, it didn't take very long. <laughs> now, I come upon one of the greatest things I ever learned. She said, these lack thoughts, which you have taken charge of and deliberately flushed out, are very uh, intuitively smart. They haven't gone very far away. They know that you're going to be lonesome without them because they've been with you for so long and they realize that if they just hang around they can sneak back in and continue to defeat you but she said they can be kept out by an act of displacement if you put into your minds a more positive powerful thought pattern you can not only keep them out you can go on to success with this project. Now, she said, how many subscribers do you need to keep this magazine going? I didn't know, but I picked a figure out of the air, and I said, 100,000 would do it. Ah, she said, 100,000. What I want you to do is to look out there and image, visualize, picturize, see. 100,000 people who had paid their subscription to Guidepost magazine. Look out there and see them, she said. So I looked out. I said, well, they, they look mighty dim if you want to know the truth. Then I turned around and I looked into her face. She had big brown eyes. And I remember that a phrase crossed my mind. The exalted look of the believer. She really believed. She was really thinking positively. And then I saw the 100,000 subscribers, and I leaped to my feet, and I said, what do you know? I see them. I see them. And she leaped to her feet, and she said, isn't that wonderful? Now that we see them, we have them. I said, how's that? She said, yes, now that we see them, we have them. Then my directors over here, who previously had been mentally frozen without an idea in their heads, suddenly became unfrozen. They became alive, and they began to throw out ideas on the table, one after the other. About 10, 90 percent of them weren't any good, but 10 percent of them were creative and innovative and uh, with it, and this magazine went on from near failure to great success. Let me tell you about a big tree that we cut down on this property once. Bigger than that tree. It was 200 years old, and I figured when the tree men came around that they would take a big saw and saw the tree off at ground level and it would topple over and they would drag it away, but they didn't do it that way at all. What did they do? They went up in the tree and they started cutting off little branches. And then they cut off bigger branches and worked down until finally they cut down the main trunk. Now, every human being who's a negative thinker has a big chunk of negative thought in his mind. And the way to get rid of it is to start snipping off the little negative. For example, your wife says to you, are you going to have a nice day today, big day, successful day? And you say, no, it's going to be the same old lousy day. Don't say that. Clip that off. And all little negatives along with it. And think positively. View everything with a new set of positive thoughts.
I've been very lucky in life in that I know a lot of very happy people. And I think the reason for that is I've been teaching the power of positive thinking. And positive thinkers are, in the very nature of the case, happy people because they have overcome negativism and they know that they're the master of problems so they have a sense of victory and they're happy. Who determines whether you or you or you or I are happy? The answer is you do. I do. We either think happy thoughts or we think unhappy thoughts and accordingly we are happy or unhappy. For example, I was on a, a train one time. This was some years ago. It was a great train known as the 20th Century Limited. It was a beautiful train. And the center of the train was the dining car, which everybody thought served the best meals in the United States. So I went up there to have a meal and sat down at a table for four. Across from me was a couple. The woman was dressed in an expensive costume, great big furs and diamonds and jewels, but she had a petulant look on her face. That word petulant says a lot. And she was full of criticism and unhappiness. She said the car was drafty, the service was poor, the food was abominable, and such, etc. Her husband, on the contrary, was an easygoing, affable, likable, uh, old boy, uh, friendly to everybody. And he was a bit embarrassed about his wife, especially since they had told me that this was he was taking her on a pleasure trip, but she obviously wasn't getting any pleasure out of it. <laughs> but finally, to change the subject, he asked me what business I was in. I told him, and then he confessed that he was a lawyer. And then he said, my wife is in the manufacturing business. This surprised me because she didn't look like a manufacturing person. So I said, and, uh, what does she manufacture? He said, unhappiness. She manufactures her own unhappiness. Well, an icy coolness descended on the table. <laughs> and yet I, I was glad for the remark because he told the truth. Some people who want to be happy instead manufacture their own unhappiness. And where do they do it? Right up in their thoughts, in the kind and quality of the thoughts that they think. That's why. I have gone around speaking all over and writing continuously. Practice the power of positive thinking because it works. It'll make you happy instead of unhappy. Now, I was very fortunate in another thing. I married a happy girl. And I would suggest to all men that they marry happy girls and all girls that they marry happy men. Because my wife, early in our marriage at breakfast, said, Honey, let's be happy today. Well, I said, I am happy. What are you bringing it up for? Well, she said, I, I just wanted to remind you, let's be happy today. Now we've been married a long time. And do you know what she said to me this very morning at breakfast? The same old thing. Honey, let's be happy today. So, don't I act happy? That's because, <laughs> that's because my wife reminded me to be a positive thinker. In fact, it's as simple as this. You can choose how you're going to be. You can decide for yourself every morning whether you're going to be happy or unhappy. Now, I've known a lot of people who practice this, 
For example, I, I was once a technical advisor for a motion picture in Hollywood. And uh, in the same studio, they were making a, another picture of which the star was a wonderful woman by the name of Hattie McDaniel. She was from down south, and she was of ample proportion, and she had a marvelous disposition, and I got to know her quite well. And I asked her how she was so happy. Well, she said one thing I do, no matter what the weather is, rain or shine, I go out of the house in the morning and I just throw my arms up and I say, hello there, good morning. And she said, I, I'm always impressed with the wonder of life. I am alive, she said, and that is terrific. And what a gift it is and I'm going to be happy with it every day, all my life. That message she gave me a long while ago, and I never forgot it, because it's as sound as the good earth on which you walk. I have noticed that positive thinkers seem to have an abundant and constant supply of energy. And I've often wondered why. And I think it's because they're interested in everything. And they're enthusiastic. And they're excited. And they don't grumble. And they love everything. And they seem to love everybody. They have no hate in their minds. For example, I met a woman not long ago. She had the same spirit. I was with my brother Leonard. We were driving from a town called Venice in southern Florida up to Tampa Airport. As we approached a little nondescript village, he said, you know, there is a restaurant in this town. It doesn't look like anything from the outside, nor is it much on the inside. But this restaurant is famous because there's a woman here who bakes pies that are the greatest pies that anybody ever ate. Well, it was about 10.30 in the morning, and we'd had a bountiful breakfast. And I said, I don't believe we can go for a piece of pie at 10.30 in the morning, do you? Well, he said, you oughtn't to pass this up. And I was easily persuaded. And we stopped and went into the restaurant, and at 10.30 in the morning, it was two-thirds filled with people all eating pie. So we ordered cherry pie. Now, I have I got to tell you, this cherry pie was absolutely exquisite. Great big cherries, very juicy, and the crust was flaky and extraordinarily tasty. It was super, and the pieces were good size. And I got through eating that, and I said, Leonard, this must be a freak piece of pie. They put out the best. Now I said, how would you think their apple pie would be? And he said, the only way to find out is to order it. So we had a piece of apple pie. Then I called a waitress over, and I said, I got to meet the woman who made this pie. Well, she said, she's right back in the kitchen. Why don't you go on back? I went back, and I said to a woman back there, who's the lady that made this pie? And she said, it's, it's Mary there in the white dress. I went over and shook her by the hand. I said, ma'am, I want to tell you something. I've eaten pie all over the world, and I'm an expert in pies. And I never in my born days had pie that could equal yours. You know what she said? That's what they all say. <laughs> I said, how many pies 
do you bake per day? Well, she said, 47 to 50. I said, well, that's a big job, isn't it? What time do you get up to, to bake those pies and get them down here? She said, four o'clock in the morning, six days a week. Mm -hmm. On the seventh day, I cease from my labors like the good book says, and I go to church, which is a total loss to civilization because she baked no pies <laughs> on Sunday. And I said, well, don't you ever get tired? Tired, she said, no. Why should I get tired? Well, I said, why don't you get tired? She said, because I love what I'm doing, baking pies to please the public. Well, you know, naturally she would have energy. She wouldn't think, oh, have I got to get up again and bake all those pies. The quality of those pies would deteriorate if she said that. She poured her energy and she poured her love into those pies. So that's the way you have a constant energy supply. Well, there's another thing. I made a speech in Chicago one time, not too long ago. And I, in a big auditorium, and I tore into it, gestures and body language and all this and that, I really tore into it. And when I came down off the platform, a reporter said to me, where in the world do you get all this energy? He said, I know you run around all over, over the United States on airplanes and everything. One town this night and another town the next night, and you write books and you do all this kind of thing. Where do you get all this energy? Well, I said, I don't know. Well, he said, you must have some secret of, of energy. What is it? Well. I said, I tell you, I think the source of energy for me personally is in a quotation. And it goes like this. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, he said, boy, that's a honey. Where'd you get that? Well, I said, do you mean to tell me you don't know where I got it? No, he said, I never heard it before. Well, I said, that happens to be in a book known as the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, the 31st verse. Well, he was very interested. He said, it's all in there. You start with great enthusiasm. Then you have to run to keep up with things. Then you get down to where you walk. But you have energy all the way. It's the greatest secret that I ever found of abundant and continuous energy supply. Inherent in positive thinking is what I like to call the magic of believing. This is actually based on a statement in the New Testament. If thou canst believe, nothing is impossible to him that believeth. So it's essential if you want to make a success in life, that you've got to believe in your goals, in your objectives, in yourself, in your job, in life itself. The magic of believing, well named because there's magic in it. Let me illustrate that by a sports story of quite a few years ago. There was a baseball manager by the name of Josh O'Reilly, 
and he was a very capable man. He had a great aggregation of players. Indeed, seven of his players regularly batted over 300. And it would seem that his team would capture the championship without too much trouble. But early in the season, they went into what we call a slump. They lost 17 of their first 20 games. And this was discouraging to everybody. Josh O'Reilly knew he had to do something about it. And he was very adroit in what he did. There was a preacher in the neighborhood by the name of Reverend Slater, who claimed to be a faith healer. And he did get some astounding results. And everybody locally believed in Reverend Slater. So Josh O'Reilly called the team together and he asked each player to give him his two favorite bats. And when he'd collected the bats, he put them in a wheelbarrow and asked the team to remain in the clubhouse until he returned. He returned an hour later and announced that he had taken the bats to Reverend Slater, who had laid his hand on each one of them and blessed them. The players were astounded. They suddenly became different men. And in the next game, they hammered out 37 hits, which yielded 20 runs. And there after they hammered their way through the league to a victory. Now, when you examine that, any reasonable person knows that nothing had changed the bats. They were still a piece of wood, like they were before. But something had happened to the minds of these players. They recovered their talent instantly. Formerly, they were expecting to be defeated, and they were. And usually, what you expect, if you expect it deeply enough, will come to pass. Now, they expected to win, whereas formerly, they expected to lose. And they exercised victoriously the magic of believing. Well, that's a story out of sports that illustrates this great truth that if we believe, if we expect, if we think we can, we can. Another story illustrating the magic of believing, which I've always liked, is that of the young fellow who, for some reason, wanted to be a performer on the high trapeze bar. You've seen those bars in circuses where people are 50 feet above the ground, swinging through the air with apparent ease. Well, he was fascinated by that. So he went to a school uh, where the teacher was one of the famous trapeze artists of the country. And finally, he'd been taught the skill and he had natural aptitude. But the day came when he was first to perform on this high trapeze bar, 50 feet in the air. The boy looked at it, and all of a sudden, mentally, he froze. Fear seized him. And he said, I can't do it. I can't do it, because he had a picture of himself falling from that bar, crashing to the ground, and he was horror, horror struck. And the teacher came over, put his arm around his shoulder, and he said, son, you can do it. You have natural aptitude for this. You're one of the best students I've ever had. I know you have the skill, but You've got to get a different image, not of failure, but of the exhilaration of performing in that height, 
fluently, with ease, rhythmically, beautifully. Now, I said, the secret is this, and I want you to never forget it. Throw your mind over that bar, and your body will follow. It's a beautiful picture of thinking success, and then your entire personality flowing toward successful performance. Throw your mind over that bar of every obstacle you'll ever have to face, and the rest of you will follow. That surely is the magic of believing. I'd like to speak about how to break the worry habit, and it is a habit. Now, one must never write off worry as something ordinary and therefore not important. It is a deep, dark, irrational blackness of the mind in which the person feels that something terrible is going to happen. And thousands upon thousands of people today are afflicted with anxiety, worry, and fear. Well, I personally like the definition of whereby you describe worry in terms of an old Anglo-Saxon word, weirgan. Weirgan meant literally to strangle or to choke. So if I approached any one of you and put my hands around your throat in this manner, I would be doing to you dramatically what you do to yourself if you are a practitioner of worry. You are literally choking or strangling your vital powers. It's that important. Well, how do you eliminate it? Well, in answer to that question, I think of Howard Chandler Christie, who years ago was one of the most famous artists in the United States. And when I was sitting for him, I noticed that he seemed to have a total absence of anxiety and worry. He was always very positive. So uh, since I had a speech coming up on how to overcome worry, I, I interrogated him. I said, Howard, don't you ever worry? Oh, he said, never. Don't believe in it. It's no good. Well, I said, didn't you ever worry? Well, he said, yes, I did one day about 40 years ago, but I gave it up and I haven't worried since. Now I said, come on, you mean you haven't worried for 40 years? He said, yes, I, I didn't worry much before that, but I noticed that everybody was worrying and I wanted to experience everything that human beings experience and I figured I was missing something. So I decided that I was going to worry. And I set a, a particular day as my worry day. On the worry day, I had a big breakfast because I was told that one should never worry on an empty stomach. And I worried my head off until about 10 o'clock and I gave it up as a bad job and I haven't worried ever since. Well, I said, that's the most amazing thing. How did you overcome worry, or how did you avoid it? Well, he said, it's very simple. You worry with your head, don't you? And he, he said, if you control what 
goes on in your head, you won't worry. Now, he said, what is stronger than worry or fear? And he answered his own question. He said, it's faith. So if you fill your mind full of faith, fear and worry can't get into your head. For example, I had a tailor years ago in Brooklyn by the name of S. Pearson. He was a wonderful man and a great tailor. And his prices were right compared to present prices. <laughs> uh, so I'd never had a tailor-made suit before. And boy, was I proud of it. It was wonderful. Now he said, Norman, this is the first time you've ever had a tailor-made suit. You've got to learn how to take care of your suit. When you go to bed at night, you must hang it up neatly. And he showed me how to hang a suit. And he said, you must take everything out of the pockets. You must empty every pocket. Now, it's my habit to have stuff in my pockets. Even in a sweater, I, I, I have a pocket. I stick things in it. And so he said, stand by the wastebasket. Well, you empty your suit, and you take all the stuff out of it, and you examine it. Is this worth keeping? And if you decide it isn't, drop it in the wastebasket. Empty your pockets, and you'll preserve your suit. Well, one night while I was doing that, I thought, if you empty the pockets to preserve the suit, how do you preserve the mind and its operation? And I thought, why isn't it a good idea to empty the mind before you go to sleep? Now, in the course of a day, you put many things in your mind, a disappointment, a frustration, a resentment, an anxiety, or a worry, or you do something that you didn't do it very well, and that bothers you. So I stood by the wastebasket, mentally visualizing, taking stuff out of my head and dropping it in the wastebasket. And I did that, and you know, I, I had one of the most beautiful night's sleep I had ever had because I had emptied my mind. And then I knew a man who, who did both in a very wonderful way. His name was Harry. He was a friend of mine. He was a fellow member of the New York Rotary Club. And one day I was there having lunch, and Harry was at the table. And he was spouting off a lot of worries, and I got to know him. I think he was probably the greatest worrier that I ever knew in New York City. And believe me, that's saying something, because there are lots of them down there. And, and uh, then I noticed that Harry changed, and he didn't come out with all these negative thoughts anymore. He became a real positive thinker. And as for expressing fear, anxiety, or worry, that was totally absent from his characteristics. And I was impressed, and I commented on it to him. Well, he said, I tell you what, come down and join me for dinner some evening, and I'll, I'll tell you about it. But he said, I want you to meet me at my office at closing time, which was about 5 o'clock. I went into his office, and there was a big desk. And formerly, it had been very cluttered. But now there wasn't a paper on it. And I said, what do you know about that? Perfect clean desk. Well, he said, that's the product of an orderly mind. He said, I used to be so frustrated and worried that I let everything go, but now I got organized. Organized. He said, Are you ready to go out for dinner? I said, Yep, anytime. So we got up and moved toward the door. And he said, Wait a minute. And he stopped. And on the wall, by the door, not over his desk, but by the door, was a small calendar. Not one of these calendars which shows a week or a month but only one day. 
There it was. And underneath it was a wastebasket. Now, you'd think a wastebasket would be under the desk, but he had it under the calendar on the wall. He stopped, reached out his hand in this manner, and dug into that calendar and ripped off that particular day. Then he folded it up in a little ball and suspended his hand over the wastebasket. Meanwhile, he closed his eyes and I saw his lips moving. And then he opened his eyes and dramatically let that day fall into the wastebasket. Gone. I said, did you say a prayer while you were doing that? He said, yes. I said, what did you say in the prayer? Oh, he said, it's not your kind of a prayer. Uh, I don't want to tell you. I said, yeah, I want to know. Well, he said, if you want to know, and you must know, it's, oh, it ran something like this. I said, Lord, you gave me this day, and I thank you for it. And I did the best I could do with it. But good or bad, it's finished, it's through with, and I'm giving it back to you. Amen. Now he said, come on, let's go out and have a good time. Harry simplified a complex problem just to do the best you can and then forget it. And as my mother used to say, angels can do no better. You don't need to be a practitioner of the worry habit just walk away from it. I'd like to talk this afternoon about a very great principle in successful living. I call it the I don't believe in defeat principle. And it is a large part of positive thinking. And I had a wonderful demonstration of it one day, several years ago, right here on this golf course. I was playing here with a man who was an excellent golfer. He was also a philosopher. And over there on number five, I hit the ball into the rough, into grass that was five or six inches high. I, when we get up to our, my ball, I said with some dismay, oh, just look at that. What a bad lie. I am really in trouble here. This is going to ruin my game. My friend said, let's examine this situation to see whether it has the seeds of defeat or whether you can bring victory out of it. So I said, well, look at that lie. Well, he said, if that ball was lying out on the fairway, do you think you could get a good hit? And I said, yeah, I think I could. Well, he said, it has the same relative position here that it does out in the short grass. The only difference here is you've got grass, it's about five or six inches high. Now, he said, let's examine that grass. So he got down, pulled a blade of it, and said to me, chew it. I chewed it, and he said, it's tender, isn't it? And I said, yeah, that's pretty tender grass. Well, he said, if you take a five iron and believe that it can do it and don't have a defeatist attitude, you can get under that ball and lift it right up on the green. Hmm. Thus encouraged. Do you know what I did? I made a beautiful shot with this five iron 
and lifted it onto the green four feet away from the cup. He said, I want to point out to you what this incident teaches. The rough is only mental. You build up the rough in your mind out of all proportion to its importance. And he said, don't we do that with obstacles? We run into a difficulty, we build it up big, and it defeats us instead of our handling it effectively. So it is in whatever you do in this life. When I was about uh, 18 years of age, I got a job one summer selling aluminum cooking utensils, aluminum ware. I lived at the time in Greenville, Ohio, a small town just about eight miles from the Indiana border, on the other side of which was another town about of equal size called Union City. And I bought this uh, kit for $30, and a sales talk went along with it. I read the sales talk until I thought I knew how to sell the aluminum ware. And I got on a streetcar and went over to Union City because I didn't have the nerve to sell in Greenville. And when I got over there, I passed up a street. And then the second street, I decided I'd better really march up and do my sales talk. But I came to a house and the grass wasn't cut, the paint was peeling off the house, and I said, there's no use going in there because they're not progressive people. They wouldn't have any use for aluminum ware. So I rationalized it. I went on to the next house. The lawn was cut, the house was neat, everything was beautiful, and I said, these are progressive people. They already have aluminum ware. And then I knew I was just kidding myself. So at the next house, I said, walk up to the door and sell that woman. So I walked up to the door and praying that nobody would respond. I knocked very lightly on the door. And the biggest woman I ever saw in my life stood in the doorway. She said, what do you want? And I said, you don't want any aluminum work, do you? <laughs> She said, of course not, and she slammed the door in my face. Well, I figured I'd done enough for the, that day, and I went home to Greenville, and I was discouraged, and I told my father, I said, I'm no good as a salesman. He said, one principle we have in this house is I don't believe in defeat. Now, he said, I, no son of mine is going to take a licking. You go right back over there tomorrow and sell that aluminum ware. Get with it. Well, I said, it's a lonely job. Well, he said, why don't you sell part interest in your business to Harry and have him go over there with you? So I did. I collected $15 from Harry, gave him the sales kit and the sales talk, and I said, study up on this tonight. And tomorrow morning, we're going over to Union City and have a terrific day selling. So the next day, we got on the streetcar, got over to Union City. We came up to the first street. He said, shall we get off here and sell on this street? Now, I said, I worked that street yesterday. We went on to the second street. Now, I said, Harry, the way you do this is you don't take no for an answer. And you don't think of yourself. You believe that that woman in there needs what you have to sell. So you walk up to that door and be positive and firm and have a victorious spirit and bang on the door and she'll come and you'll sell her. He said, okay, son, you do the same. So I walked up my walk and Harry walked up his walk. I got up on my porch and Harry got up on his porch and he waved to me from across the street. He said, I'm with you, sell her. So I banged on the door in a peremptory manner, and the littlest woman you ever saw stood there. And I said, Madam, I have come to render you a real service. I'm bringing you the finest cooking ware known in the world today. It's aluminum. Oh, she said, how nice, come right in. I went in and I sold her the biggest order. I sold her all summer. I sold anybody all summer. 
So Harry had a good day and I had a good day. And we went back to Greenville and I told my father all about it. He said, what did I tell you? Always live by the principle that you don't believe in defeat. Never take a licking. Go right back at it again. And don't think negatively. Don't think you can't. Think positively. Think that you can. Well, that was a simple story out of my selling experience, but I never forgot it. And so it is that we face difficulties in this life every now and then, and some of them are very tough. But the rough is only mental. That is, it's what you think about it. And by adopting the principle, I don't believe in defeat, we become winners in life. I remember a man called me from Elmira, New York one time and said, I've got to come down to the city and see you because everything has gone wrong with me. Nothing is left. I am totally defeated. Well, I said, come on down, we'll talk about it. He came in and sat down. He was a nice fellow, but you could see he was very depressed. And he said, everything is gone. I said, everything? Totally? Yeah, he said, totally. Oh, I said, I'm so sorry to hear that your wife is dead. Why, he said, my wife isn't dead. Who said she was dead? She's very alive. Well, I said, that's great. I said, let's take a piece of paper and put up here your assets and your debits. Well, I said, there won't be anything in the assets. Well, I said, you just told me your wife was still alive. And I said, I'm sorry to hear your children are all in jail. Well, he said, who, what, where'd you get that idea of my children are in jail? So I wrote down number two, children not in jail. <laughs> and I said, I'm awfully sorry to hear that your house up there in Elmira burned down. Why, he said, who said it burned down? So I wrote number three, house didn't burn down. And then he grinned and he said, I get the idea. When I said, you told me that all your assets were gone. Nothing left. Now, let's continue adding them up. And I finally said, uh, have you lost your faith in God? No, he said, I'm a good believer. Well, I said, that's, that's the important one, because no matter what your disasters may be, you can always recoup if you haven't lost faith. Faith is the great recouping agent. Well, by this time, I had smiles on his face, and he got up and shook hands with me, and he said, I've been a fool. I said, you're not the only one. <laughs> I've been often myself. And he went back up to Elmira with an entirely different attitude. Now, he had problems, plenty of them, but he handled them because a person of faith can really handle anything. It says in the Bible, this is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. And that is a point that the positive thinker underscores and stresses. I knew a man in Queens. He had one trouble after another. I never knew a man that had any more troubles, 
poured on him at one time than this poor fella. As he said appropriately, life threw the whole book at him. Now, Shakespeare says something about troubles come not in single spies, but in battalions. When you have troubles, you have a lot of them at one time, seemingly. Well, this poor fellow was rocked by it. He was really sunk with the disasters, trials, tribulations, and problems of human life. But then the worm turned. He became defiant of all his troubles. And he raised up his arm and lying there in bed and he shouted out, I believe, I believe, I believe. And his wife came in startled and he said, honey, I feel better. And he got up, went down to his office, felt better than he had any time since his troubles started ganging up on him. He felt so good that the next morning he repeated the process. I believe, I believe, I believe. And this became routine with him. And as he continued this process, he felt better and better and better. And he finally got on top of his problems. He still had some of them, and he still had some crises and disasters. But now he became master of them, and he learned to live with them. And one day I said to him, what do you believe that you're shouting out every morning? Oh, he said, I don't know. I believe in everything. He said, I, I believe in my wife, I believe in my children, I believe in my community, I believe in my city, I believe in my country, I believe in my company, I believe in my job. And he said, I believe in myself. And he added, I've got my old belief in God back. He is with me and I'm not alone. That's what positive thinking really teaches that no matter what may happen to you, through faith, you have what it takes to or live with it.